thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. Of course, thank you to Stuart Rosenthal for organizing. Uh, but forgive me for saying this, I am the absolute shock to have so many people here, so I, I, very much, uh, I, very much, uh, I also am a little bit disappointed. I, I actually was hoping to take a nap for the next hour. I'm sure no one was going to come. But, uh, but thank you. As, as we had two listeners, I can't tell you how inspiring it is for so many people to take the time to come out. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to uh, do two things in a relatively brief amount of time. I want to give a general sense for what happened in Sleep House, even talk a little bit about the parts of Sleep House. And then specifically, I would like to go through some different understandings of the 13 Midos of Hashem, God's 13 divine attributes. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a few moments. And then, maybe if there's time to take some comments or questions, and then we will hand the program over to Mr. Martin Jacobs, who we're so glad to join us today. Um, the whole concept of saying slichos, uh, literally, by the way, a slicha is, is asking God for forgiveness. The whole concept is, is uh, old standing minog in the history of Clown Israel. Uh, the, com the composition of the slichos is dated back, the early ones dated back to the 8th century. Uh, some as late as the 16th century, Gaonim period, Rishonim period, but it goes far back. Um, as many of you know, Spartan have a very different practice when it comes to Slichos. Spartan, the practice of saying Slichos starting from the beginning of the month of Elul. Uh, so we Ashkenazim blow show from say Dabra Shemori, they get up an hour earlier and say Slichos. Kola uh, Kabot to them. Uh, it is a very powerful thing to think about, even if we haven't said Slichos all that time. It's the idea of Rosh Chodesh Elul is that that was the day Moshe Rabbeinu went up on the mountain to receive the second set of Lukos, the second set of tablets. Spent 40 days, so when does he come down? Yom Kippur. So the period, so that is why Yom Kippur is our ultimate day of forgiveness on the Jewish calendar, because we got the second set of tablets. But the beginning of that period of forgiveness was Rosh Chodesh Elul. But that's not what the Ashkenazim do in terms of Slichos. The Ashkenazim start traditionally the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah. Uh, don't get nervous. Rosh Hashanah is not this week. Rosh Hashanah is next week. So why is it that we're starting this week? It's a fascinating idea in Halakha. We're supposed to have a minimum of four days of Slichos. Why is it that we're supposed to have a minimum of four days of Slichos? There are two basic reasons brought in the Halakha commentaries. Uh, one is a very technical thing. There were people who would fast each of the 10 days of repentance. And some of the days were already Shabbos or Yom Tiv or every Yom Kippur, so they couldn't fast. So he wanted to give them days that they could kind of make up. But I would like to focus on the other reason cited, which is that we say on Rosh Hashanah, we're bringing ourselves as an offering before God. It's very interesting. Uh, the language in the Torah, when it comes to the special Musaf offering of different Yom and Tovim, is traditionally the Hikraf Tem. You should bring, bring this animal, bring that animal. When the Torah discusses the language of the Musaf offering for Rosh Hashanah, the language is Basi Sem. You should make. And the way it's understood, what do you, mean you should make a korban. I can't, I can't make an animal. The idea is I'm supposed to make myself a korban. And specifically on Rosh Hashanah, not on the other holidays of the year. Ironically, we don't have that idea in the context of Yom Kippur either. Specifically by Rosh Hashanah, this is the day in the year that, that we designate that we really need to bring ourselves before Kodesh Baruch It's kind of the beginning of that process of repentance in a more serious way. The halacha is that when an animal is brought as a korban, it needs to be set aside four days before it's actually brought as a sacrifice to make sure there's no blemishes in the animal. Therefore, we, a minimum of four days before Rosh Hashanah, need to put ourselves under a greater scope of introspection. And that happens through Slichos. And it, so that's really that. So Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, of course, the 10 days of repentance, that's really where it's at. But this is the beginning of, of, of the reaction up period. And it, it's, it's just a, a very powerful thing to think about. So there's a lot of Slichos. Uh, thank God we have these wonderful books for people who have used or remember those old pamphlets. It seemed like the most important skill in Slichos was turning pages back and forth. And uh, so well, what, what's the core of what Slichos is about? There's really two parts of the most important parts of Slichos. Um, one is the Yudhimu Minos Rachman. 
the, the God's 13 divine attributes. In a few moments, we'll go through quickly and just highlight some parts just so people know what we're talking about. But conceptually, the 13 attributes of mercy, we take so many opportunities over these days to keep on talking about these 13 attributes of mercy. Uh, fascinating halacha. We're not supposed to say them in the normal way if we're not in the presence of the minion. You can read the psukim, you know, it's full psukim, the, the psukim which, which relate the 13 attributes. You can read them, you can do them with the uh, cantillation notes of the, of the psukim. Sorry. Uh, just to, uh, thank you, just to show uh, the, uh, to, to relate to it that you're reading these verses, but to say it as a prayer, only if you have a minion. There's very few things in our prayer book that you can only say with a minion. Uh, there's a whole idea, Aramaic, prayers are made like Kaddish and things of that sort. Aramaic is considered a very special language. But this is a psukim in the Torah. The only other thing comparable to this is the idea of the Kedusha. The Kedusha, you know, we say only as a minion. In the, in the, Hebrew, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew phrases of the Kedusha. But these 13 attributes, famously, after the sin of the golden <coughs> camp, uh, God is ready to destroy the Jewish people, and Moshe Rabbeinu turns to God and evokes these 13 attributes of mercy. And this is supposed to be the merit of saving the Jewish people. By the way, the measure says that when God taught Moshe these attributes, the image, whatever this means exactly, but the image was that God was wrapped in a talus like a chasm. And he teaches Moshe these attributes. And he says to people, your offspring will need to use these attributes in different times over the generations. So we take so many opportunities to mislichos. And that, in, in all candor, is one of the biggest page turners uh, back and forth of the old slichos books because we keep on coming back to it. And basically what we do is between what we call a, a slicha, which is just a specific composed prayer, we keep on jumping back and forth. Essentially the slicha is a placeholder to give us something else to talk about because once we finish talking about that, we're coming back to the 13 attributes of mercy. So that's a core part. Of, of the Slichos Davening. Um, and the other one, of course, is the Bidui, the Confession, uh, the Yoshamnus. Uh, we spoke about that uh, in a class here last week as part of this program. Those are the two most important parts. So what I'd like to do for a moment, if, 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 I'm not going to do this long. If you don't have a book or you don't want to follow along, that's fine. I just want to just take tonight as an example. It is a little bit confusing. I want to go very quickly, just, again, we're not going to go in great detail, but just to, to highlight what's going on. Um, if you turn to page two, it's generally speaking, a much greater sense of accomplishment when you're near the end of this era, so we when you're far along in the book. Uh, at the beginning, it's a little daunting. But uh, when you're on uh, so page two, traditionally we begin the sleepless with Ashrei. Ashrei is, is a powerful prayer, and we frequently will begin to give us with Ashrei. So we say the Ashrei, most of us are familiar with that, and then we say Kaddish. The, the famous tonight, of course, we'll say the famous tune, the Kaddish that evokes such a such an emotional feeling for us, this, this that we only say this time of year. And then if you look at the bottom of page three, L'cha Hashem Hatzdaka. This is an introductory tefillos slichos. Many of us actually find the, the tefillos in this introductory section, the things that we remember the best. We say it every time of slichos. Some of these psukim are extremely powerful. Some of us even no tunes, you know, that fit into this. But this is really introductory. This is not, I mean, it's very powerful. It gets us kind of in the mode. And that runs through the bottom of page five. That runs through the bottom of page five. And now, on page six, we have our first, it's actually technically not called a slicha, it's called a psicha, it's like an opening slicha. This is the first thing that's not consistent day to day. That's an opener. And then if you look in the middle of page six, that's always the standard follower of the opener. That is a standard thing. And then, at the top of page seven, we know you as being the God of abundant mercy, of abundant patience, excuse me. And that is an introductory prayer to Gimelinos. Uh, traditionally, the Chazan says, Vayavor Hashem HaPama Vayikra, if you see in the second paragraph here, and that's a quote from the Pesukim leading into the Yudimomidos, where God is, is teaching Moshe these 13 attributes, and then traditionally the congregation responds with the Yudimomidos. And then, as we continue, 
on page eight, this is the first real slicha. Back and forth. And if you look then, so we said the slicha, now we're going to say, Kelmelech Hosheva Ksirachanim. That's the standard mode that leads into the Yudhimumidos. And you see again, right in the middle of page nine, you do the Yudhimumidos again. And, and that's what you see. I don't want to take too much time over it. We say slicha, there's an introductory prayer to Yudhimumidos. Back to Yudhimumidos. Slicha, introductory prayer, back to Yudhimumidos. It's a little bit more detailed than what I'm saying, but that, that's the gist. When we've gotten through the basic format, if you jump now to uh, on page 13, there's something called the Pismo. Now I should clarify that for most of us, the Pismo hits home a little bit more than the Slicha. It could be for different reasons. It could be that, you know, maybe the Chazan says it with a little bit of a tune. Honestly, the fact that it said responsibly, I think, gives us a moment to, to gather what we're actually saying. You know, the sleep kind of moves quickly. But technically speaking, to be honest with the Pismon holds no greater importance than any of the other sleep house. But traditionally, the last sleep of the set is set responsibly with the Chazan. I, I should also just mention, because it's always a point of confusion, traditionally the way the Pismon is done is the Chazan says the introductory line, and the congregation says, oh, the introductory uh, stanza, and the congregation says that stanza and then says the next stanza. So the chazan starts out, the congregation then says two, and then, and then the chazan basically follows the congregation. That's a, it's always a great confusion. And uh, then, by the way, if anyone's wondering what we do after the Pismo, we go back to the Gimel Rizos. So let's think about it. We're just skipping through the pages we have tonight, God willing, something like, I, maybe someone will correct me, I think four different times we'll say the Gimel Rizos. Many times the Yudhimomidos are part of one of the slichos. And we'll see it over the, over the different days, but many times it actually says for part of the slichos. And then in the middle of page 14, the same way that there was a standard introduction to the slichos that was every day, there's a standard kind of wrap up of the slichos which begins with Sforach Mecha Hashem Machasad in the middle of page 14. Again, many of us have a stronger association with this because we say it day after day. Many of these psukim are very powerful. And then we have on page 16 the, the famous Shema Kalei Hashem Elohim. The Arun is open, and that said responsibly. And that, which again, just so there's not confusion, that the Chazan says and the congregation follows. The Chazan puts us back in our place. You know, if anyone thought that we could leave the Chazan all the time, that was just the fifth moment. When we get the Shema Kalei, we're back to following the Chazan. Um, and then we have the Hashem variations on the at least in this book, and he has the Ashamus three times. Again, there's, there's something in between the Ashamus. Uh, but this is because we stand and we bend over and we strike our chest. And then after that, there's again just a series of I'm now at the top of 18, which is a series of general prayers. At this point to be very honest with you, people are probably going pretty quickly. Uh, but it's the same prayers again and again. If you have time, day after day, if you have time to look at some of these prayers, are extremely beautiful. Um, Mr. Jacobs, your your Rahmana Da'ana is already echoing in my ears now as I'm getting ready. Uh, page page twenty in, in in the middle, the middle of page twenty, and this is the end of it. It's it's a very beautiful uh, brief prayer in Aramaic. Uh, that we say every day, and then that leads into Tachem. And then after Tachanun, there's again some additional prayers, <coughs> and then I'll say the the at the end. I, forgive me for running quickly, but at least I want to give you a little bit of a feel. But just to reiterate, the most important parts are the Yudhya Momidos and the Shamans. Um, people frequently ask me, what are they supposed to do if they fall behind the congregation? Okay. It's, a very, it's, a very, uh, it's a very common question. Um, I, I normally advise, uh, honestly, you don't say all the slichas, you know, all the, the specific compositions in between. The, the more you give me those that you can say, it's a nice thing. I, I, on a practical level, I normally recommend to people, say the complete slicha, whatever you're saying. But many times, by the time you're finished a slicha, they're like on the next slicha. Uh -huh. I, I normally skip ahead after I'm finished the, the slicha that I'm finished. But many times you finish the slicha, not only on the next slicha, but they're about to do the 13 attributes following the next slicha. So then I would say just wait a moment and you'll jump into the 13 attributes with them. 
we normally say the 13 attributes with the minimum. And as, as it should be clear with what I'm saying, that's one of the most powerful opportunities <coughs> in this um, in this sleep house. Um, I don't know if there's just, uh, maybe we'll take a question or two before we just go on to something else briefly. Any, any comments, questions? What did they do before they had these texts? I don't know. It could be they they took days for chuba. You know what I mean? Maybe they didn't have a formal to be I, I honestly assume um, I could be wrong about it. I I I, I, I sort of assumed that they didn't have formal sleepless before that. That this was a later advent. But I could be wrong about it. Well, we know the Rosh Hashanah youth um, are much older. Yeah. Right. So there were things that were being proposed. Right. And then, of course, they came under the same Kabbalah and then Right. For all I know, maybe they got together, they said, you know, Ashray, they said, uh, you cut pit luck, and they said, you give me those and Didri. You know, that could also be, you know, like we're talking about right. these are the main things. Maybe that's all they said. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has any more knowledge about that. I don't know. Thank you. I don't know. Anything else? What I'd like to do very quickly is I would like to highlight some of the explanations of the commentaries of the 13 Midos Um Not only can I not remember now, I couldn't even remember this afternoon. The fact that I can't remember now is not saying much. But I saw once, I forgot from where, it might have been a very major source. One of the things that we're trying to evoke when we go through the 13 attributes of mercy, I mean, God knows what his 13 attributes of mercy are. So as we come together as a minion and we say to God, we want you to know our your 13 attributes. So of course, the most basic answer is we know God is compassion and we pray to him that you be, be compassion. I believe I once saw from someone that the more we resolve to emulate these attributes of mercy in our own lives, and we think about them as we say, the more we resolve to emulate God in these respects, the more of a, of a merit it is for us that he should conduct himself towards us with mercy. It's an interesting thing to think about. So whether it be for that, whether it be for the purpose of the request, I just want to go through, not even all of them, I just want to highlight some of the points from the first year. If anyone has a page, uh, for example, it happens to be on page 9, if anyone just wants to follow along, in the middle of page 9. So the 13 attributes begin, you know, if you see the paragraph beginning by Yavor Hashem, the next line is Hashem Hashem. That's what it begins with, the 13 attributes. So, uh, many of us know the, uh, the name Hashem is associated with mercy from God. It has that, that association. But the question that many are always curious about is why does it say the, the name of Hashem twice? What's the message of that? <coughs> so Rashi brings down famous the Shad is the first time we say Hashem, we just, God, you look, you look at us with compassion and mercy just from day one. Our very existence is a compassion from you. All the, the wonderful blessings we have in our life is, 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 a, is an expression of your compassion. Additionally, after we sin and we come to you in repentance and you accept that repentance, it's another manifestation of your compassion. So before I did a sin, I'm living by your chesed. And certainly after you accept my repentance, I'm certainly living by your chesed. That's what Rashi says. Um, Rabbeinu Bachan says that one Hashem teaches that when a person does tshuva, when a person repents, God has mercy on him. Okay? The second one teaches that even if a person doesn't repent, God has mercy also. Now, obviously, the mercy is far greater if a person repents. So he says, Rabbeinu Bachan says such an interesting thing. We have a famous idea. The compassion of God is on all of his creations. All of God's creations is the So he says, so what's the pshat? He says, this is what it means. <coughs> they have, he, and he says, it's like a parent having compassion for a child. Right? So we see, we see our child do something inappropriate. So maybe we need to teach him a lesson or her a lesson. Maybe we don't. But 
and our affection for this child, even before they hopefully right the wrong, we have a special feeling of understanding where they're coming from, understanding what their flaws are, and understanding who they are. So Bin Bach says that's why it says a twice. Certainly, Rachman is with our Shuba, but also Rachman is even before we repent. So I'm go through it with it. Thank you. Um, uh, just as an aside, before we go on, the Sforno says an interesting thing. The Sforno says it's not as much of an emphasis as God's mercy, but it's something else. The, uh, the name of Hashem, you know, famously Hashem represents that He was, He is, and He always will be. Meaning, in this context, everything that exists in this <coughs> world is only by the grace of God. Everything. So I look around, you know, we sit there and say, God, you know, I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this. You know, but the fact that I got that paint job is your Rachmanus. Thank you, thank you. It was a kindness from you. I got a good deal on it. You were so kind to me. The Sporno says the fact that you breathe today is a kindness from God. It's a whole different uh, perspective. Okay, the next thing is Kale. Kale, Rashi says Kale is also a, a name that evokes God's mercy. There's a famous phrase, Kale, Kale, Lama Azav Tani. My God, my God, why have you left me? So you wouldn't say that if Kale doesn't mean that God is merciful. If Kale means that God is just, I left you because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So Kale, it's a language of mercy. The Sforno, remember the Sforno was the one who says everything in this world only exists by the grace of God. So the Sforno explains the language of Kale is that every action in this world is only through God's, through the force that God gives it. There's not just everything's existence, but everything we do, every act we make, every act by society is only by the assistance of God. Kale is a language of force. Okay. We say that God is a rachum v'cham. Those are both languages of compassion. So what's the... Um, so the evidence has an interesting nuance here. Again, there's so many more things that I want to say. I'm just highlighting a few approaches. Yeah, but Ezra says, Rachum is like a parent um, saving his child from falling in the first place. And Hanun is, if a person does fall, then God helps them act and fall. So Rachum is there so many times in life that I didn't even appreciate how you protected me. And Hanun is, when I did fall in the shower, you helped me out. Theoretically <laughs> speaking. Um, so, yeah, just for no, what I do for this congregation, I you, uh, the Sforno, the Sforno says, um, this is not on the nuance between Rachel and Hanun, it's just on, on the word Rachel. Uh, the Sforno says, they are, if a person does something and they should be receiving some kind of punishment from, God, from above, and they daven to God, the fact that when we daven to Hashem, He has compassion on us, that's what Rachman is here, which is extremely powerful to think about in these days. Because you could ask a lot of this, if God's merciful, what are we getting up in the middle of the night for? He's so nice, He's so benevolent, uh, and you know, let me do tshuva anyway, I'll repent. This is specifically the power of prayer. And that, that's something to think about in the context of Slichos. Um, one more thing on Hanun before we go on. Hanun also seems to be a language of compassion. There's a famous Ramban. The Ramban <coughs> says that Hanun is related to the word Chinam. Chinam means for free. You know, we, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but. Many times in life, a person makes a request. Think in professional settings and communal settings. A person makes a request that without the request, we wouldn't have gotten what we wanted. But uh, the, the request is an appropriate request. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not a ridiculous request. And we ask them, they say, great. Yes, request granted, fine. Every now and then in life, there's no reason in the world why our request should be granted. There's no, I mean, who are you? you, know, you why? why what, what do we owe you? So that's what Khanabi says to Rambam. Person makes a request of God and doesn't necessarily deserve anything. Even within the scope of God accepting a people's request, sometimes he gets it anyway. So Hashem Hashem Kirachim Kanon Erech Apayim, he is abundant of patience. Rashi famously says that the idea is 
that uh, if we sin, God could snap his fingers and bring us the punishment for that sin right away. And the very fact that he gives us time, he gives us time to right ourselves, he gives us time to reflect, he gives us time to repent, is a tremendous manifestation of God's mercy. The Rav Chesed, and he's abundant in kindness, the MS. And he has truth. This is always sticky. So is God a judge or is God just a, a you know, just a real nice body? I mean, we say God is a judge. So what does it mean that he's abundant in, in, in kindness? So uh, Rashi says that there are people who have merits but maybe don't have so many merits. And, and sometimes they need a little bit of a, of a push to get them over the hump. And that's Rav Chesed. Interesting thing. So Rashi says, a mess, truth, is there are people who really deserve good things. You know, they really do, they really do good deeds and they really deserve good things. So that, when God, sometimes God gives a bad mess, they absolutely deserve it. Sometimes God has to give a little bit of a, of a benevolent push, uh, you know, over, over, the, over the hump. Um, Rav Chesed says that what means a mess is the truth of God is more in kindness than in harsh justice. That's Rav Chesed, and he's abundant in his kindness, and, mess, and that is the, the core manifestation of his truth. If that makes sense, it's, it's just the comment the Rav Um So we say he's no sick. Avon v'fesha v'chata. He bears all these different types of sins. People frequently ask, what are these different sins? Uh, Avon, traditionally, is understood as being intentional sins. Person knows, person knows, I'm not... I'm not supposed to say that Lashon Hara. I know I'm not supposed to say that Lashon Hara. And they just weaken in the moment. That's an Avon. A Pesha is where a person is uh, angry at God. And a person, it's a more dramatic sin. A person kind of does <coughs> sin as a statement of rebellion against God. Uh, that's Pesha. Chata is a person who didn't, didn't realize they were doing something wrong. That's an unintentional sin. But all these, uh, God has the benevolence and the ability to forgive. Then we say, Benake. Now, Benake means he cleanses us. Now, that's where we end with the 13 attributes. But truth be told, if we look at the Psukim, it's a little bit misleading. It's a little confusing because it says in Psukim, Benake, Lo Yahaket, which literally means he will cleanse, he won't cleanse. So, what, what's, uh, what's that all about? So, Rashi says a very interesting shot. Rashi says that sometimes in life, a sin is so significant, and maybe a sin is so much more significant than the appropriate repentance that we did, God can't completely wipe away the effect of the sin. Or God won't completely wipe away the effect of the sin. But what he does is he uh, it gives us a payment plan in, in, in small, small doses over a very long period of time. So if we're not K, he cleanses us of the potential punishment, but below you're not K. It's not a complete cleansing. That's an interesting shot from Rashi. Another pshat that Rashi says is, sometimes we do repent, and if we repent, he completely cleanses us. Cleanses us. Sometimes we don't repent, and if we don't repent, we don't get cleansed. But I just want to close with a sporno. And the sporno says, there's, based on the famous Gemara, there's two types of chuba. There's two types of repentance. There's chuba meyira and chuba meyava. Uh, one type of truth was a person standing in Shalom Yom Kippur. He says, you know, I'm really scared things aren't going to go well for me this year. God, I'm sorry I did the wrong things, and I'll have a plan of action to be better. That's a very sincere repentance, but it's motivated by fear. A lot of us never get there. Call a kavod to this person, but it's not, it's not the ideal form of truth. And the Gemara says that such a truth is very nice, but what God does is he takes the intentional sins from such a truth that, that, that a person repents more in such a way, and shifts them to a status of unintentional sins. But they're not struck from the record. They're just like downgraded. But then there's truth in the app. Then there's a sense of repentance out of love. That a person says, God, I have so much appreciation for what you do for me. It was just an appropriate type of this. I see all the blessings in my life, and how could I have done that? And that, the Gemara says, if a person reaches that point, all the sins are actually flipped to merits. Because if a person reaches that point, then the sins in the long run were a means of them getting to a different place. A positive place. 
So the Swordo says that's the Pshat Nak. If a person does chuva with true love, he's completely cleansed. Lo sometimes a person's not completely cleansed. Partially cleansed. If they do chuva out of a sense of I don't want to get punished. This is just a summary of, of, of some of the main points of the 13 Midos. I just want to close with um, one thought associated to, with uh, Rabbi Naftali Trump, Sikhwan al Rafa. And he says that we say tonight in Slichos, in one of those introductory lines, like poor destitute people, we knock on, we have knocked on your door. So the fakhnu is a language of great force. The knocking. So forgive the mushroom, he doesn't say this, but uh, you know, sometimes someone knocks on our door once and we're not there, and they walk away. Want to drop something off, we're not there, so they leave it in the mailbox. Uh, sometimes uh, Maybe many of us have the manifestation when a collector might come. But you knock, and if you don't pick up the door, just knock again. And uh, because, you know, they, they need it. They need it. They need you. We tell God we're people who are absolutely destitute, like people who are absolutely destitute. We're not just giving you a call. The fact of love, <coughs> we, we, with desperation, knock on your doors. And that's really, that's really the feeling that we have over these days that we begin with tonight. And uh, it really stems from a basic core desire to be greater as people, to connect in a more meaningful way to God. And to merit the Ksiba Ksim Tov of Thank you very much. Marty? Yes. Um, I just some of the things that we say in Slichas, where we have participation by people who are dominant. And uh, I think that, uh, in my experience, it, it makes it, it has uh, two effects, in addition to whatever impact it has on the show. One, one effect, it makes it easier for the person, which is very nice. And the other, I think it makes it more interesting that people are actually uh, participants in not just saying words, but also melodies, help people. Uh, and as I, I look around the room, I'm sure some of you say, "Who is this guy?" We don't, you know, we don't see him that often. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit of introduction. Uh, my wife and I, and uh, uh, at least one ch two, one child, two children, moved to uh, Kent Mill in 1969. And uh, this was our shul, but of course it wasn't here. It was in a house on uh, North Belgrade. And uh, I had the schuss of being the cousin for Rabbi Rosh Hashanah of Kippur. And so you know, there are a few people here who remember it. That's how it began. And uh, I have been very fortunate. Hashem Yisbarak has given me the, uh, the koyach to continue doing it. So I want to thank you all for having me and also tell you that one of the pleasures of, I find, of dominant for the Umlet on uh, Rosh Hashanah in particular, uh, and Yom Kippur, is when people know the melodies and sing along, and which is what happens here, especially at Shom, right? Is that it makes to me, it makes the davening much more um, meaningful and also is tremendously helpful because it's not just like you're saying words and people are listening and you're hoping that uh, God is listening, but that people are active participants. So I thank Stuart for uh, coming up with the idea of having this program tonight. And uh, we have a, an accompanist, uh, Chaim Shulman, who kindly agreed to, <coughs> to help. And we, we did a little bit of a rehearsal. So I am thinking uh, what, I, what I thought we would do is take a few of the uh, places in the Slichus where we can sing things together. Uh, and I have to say the culmination is 
Uh, of it is what Rabbi Rosenbaum started, said that he began about uh, the Rachamona prayer at the end. But I have to tell you that, that the Rachamona prayer that I learned, that we use, is I learned uh, from Chabad. And if you think about it, it is the same Rachamona song that is used by every one of the 4,000 Shluchim families uh, around the world. And in addition, I mean, just think about it, everybody singing the same melody. Uh, and I learned it from my shver, who was a Lubavitcher Hasid, who actually lived in our community for uh, 10 years and brought a different uh, approach to davening to so many people here. Uh, in any event, uh, if we can start with um, uh, on page 9. In the Kale Melech Yoshev. And what I'd, I'd like to do is sing it first by myself, and then we'll, uh, with, with time, and then we'll do it together, and that way, and we'll use it in, in Davenant, in saying the Slippers upstairs, we'll use it a few times. Yeah. 
is it's nice to sing uh, songs that are written that people know of and that they like. It's like Korean in Kedusha where people sing things that, using melodies from other things. And the problem in Slithus is that the words don't necessarily fit the melody. So the Shmoa is good because it, it, it goes to basically asking God to listen to our Atvila and uh, each phrase is different. Um, so now, turn to one that I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, not everybody, virtually everybody. Uh, page uh, 15, and it's uh, Bahabi Yosef on the bottom of the page.
me, I don't know <coughs> how you react to it, but there's uh, one thing melody to it. Uh, and the uh, last uh, is the one that I mentioned about Dark, uh, about Rachamono, uh, and it's on page 20. <laughs>
From Eitan Katz, we talk, yeah, and a shama. Second verse. Uh, second, second. Oh, second. Oh, second. Oh, second. Oh, second. 